Hey y'all, it's John Murray. And it's been a minute since I've been live with you all, but I wanted to speak with you all today. And I have a special guest joining me for this conversation because uh, I thought it was an important conversation to have today. And joining me is Dr. Taff Quincy Heatley. He's the pastor of the Shiloh Baptist Church in Alexandria, Virginia. He's the author of two books, the latest being The Pandemic Pastor. He's also a certified life coach. So Pastor Heatley, thank you for joining me today. My pleasure, my pleasure. So glad to be with you. Absolutely. Now, uh, you are both a pastor and a life coach. Talk about the intersection of those two things and, and, and how you wear both of the hats. You know, it's funny, man, because it's something that really I just got the revelation on, you know, because when I received my calling as pastor, you know, like if you think traditionally and conventionally, you think like, OK, I'm a, I'm a preach, I'm a pastor. That's it. Not understanding that my purpose is much larger than this one avenue to travel. In fact, when I felt God calling me, God told me to get my message to the masses. And you know that preaching and pastoring is just one avenue. You know, so that's where the authors comes in. And that's also the life coaching comes in. And all of that has happened this year. I'm actually speaking it into existence, man, in the process of making sure I get my full ICF certification. Um, but working with um, through the CAP Institute, my cousin actually is a coach. Her name is Valerie Burton. You may have heard of her. She's been on the Today Show doing a lot of wonderful things. And she has a wonderful, wonderful uh, institute called the CAP Institute. And um, so she's my life coach and she's taking me through some things. And I recognize that in this marketplace ministry, sometimes when people hear church and pastor, there are walls and defense mechanisms that come up because they've been hurt by the church. So I look at it as another way for me to present, you know, the gospel, but also to help people and to coach them through some issues without, without the religious and all the churchy, churchy talk, but really to get in people's soul to see, you know, how they can really walk in their why. That's why you see it behind me. That's, that's really what I'm about. Just helping people find their purpose and so their lives can be transformed. And as you know, coaching is just another avenue to do that. You know, I always, I always respect people who, who understand the balance of it too. You know, a lot of my friends have decided to embrace therapy in this season of their life. I think uh, during the pandemic, Michelle Obama freed a lot of people when she started talking about low-grade depression because a lot of people mm -hmm. were feeling things, anxiety, uncertainty, things that they couldn't explain. And she kind of gave them the language that freed them up. And the one thing I often ask my friends who are believers, when mm -hmm. they tell me they went and found a therapist, I usually say, did you find one that isn't saved? Because sometimes I felt like people who grew up in church, sometimes you start talking, you know, they say English is a second language if you move to the United States. Sometimes if you live here, you grew up in church, uh, English is a second language. Right. And so I often challenge them to go have conversations with people who don't necessarily speak that church rhetoric so right. they can tap into something different with them. But I love this idea that you understood the need to kind of wear both hats at the same time so that you could connect to a broader audience. Well, you know, it's interesting you mentioned Michelle Obama. I actually quote her in my book. I have a whole chapter on self-care. Mm -hmm. And that part of self-care, I speak about therapy. And I quote her from that CNN article where she said that she was just feeling very low in that low-grade you know, depression. And I realized that a lot of people were there. And it was actually my conversations that I had with my wife during that time period in the pandemic where we both you know, sought therapists. She has a therapist. I have my therapist. to kind of just help us talk through some things and um, you know, strength-based therapy to look at some of our strengths and try to work on those things and not you know, denying our weaknesses, but being able to see like, look, and I, I've said this in a sermon as well, because we created a counseling ministry at my church right before the pandemic, um, because we know that people need folks to talk to. Now, here's the interesting thing about that. We get more people from outside the church that take advantage of that ministry than inside. And that was to be expected. So I look at it again, another avenue where people can, you know, come and have Christ presented to them, but not necessarily with the language and the lingo of what we call tradition, again, of being conventional, because sometimes it can be offensive. But we all do know this, that I say like this, look, you can talk to Jesus and you can talk to a therapist. It is like, <laughs> like those two things are not at odds of each other. You know what I'm saying? It's actually very healing to be able to help someone help someone see something that they may not be seeing, or at least just to walk them through that. You know what that's called? That's called discipleship. Yeah. <laughs> it's just all it is. And it doesn't have to be under the umbrella of the church. You know, it's just, it's just people helping one another. You know, so, some of the churches, uh, there, uh, E. Dewey Smith's uh, church down in Atlanta, uh, mm -hmm. church up in Harlem, uh, up in New York called First Corinthians. I keep hearing about their rapid growth. And one of the mm -hmm. things that both of those churches have in common, just like yours, they've started these counseling ministries right. because uh, those pastors, just like you, recognize that Jesus and science can all work together, you know? 
the, the funny thing about that is this, man. First of all, I'm a former scientist, so I majored in math and physics. So, so I love it. I me. love it. And both E. Dewey Smith and both Michael Walman are my personal friends. They both they're both my frat brothers. They're both my Morehouse brothers, and I know them personally. In fact, I just I just talked to Mike about a um, a month ago, and I used to be in Atlanta before I came up here. And um and it was Mike Walman who know who really at First Corinthians really helped me see. He actually has a mental health clinic, and he told mm-hmm. me how that happened. I was just like, wow, man, just the imagination to see that there's a need within the community. And if there's a need, then certainly the church as the people should be able to meet that. And, um, you know, I'm definitely not the first. There are multiple ministries that understand, you know, the intersection between counseling and therapy, you know, and, you know, Christianity, because, I mean, the best therapist we know is Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> we can look at it. So, and if we're believers, again, that light shines through us. Um, and it's just really about helping people have a way just to, to want them to be better and walk in their purpose. And in order to do that, they have to be able to identify themselves and know who they are and work through the things that life presents them. And, and that's that's really the gift of love, man, you know? It really is. Now, I was going to ask this later, but since you already mentioned this particular chapter in your book, I want to pivot to this question. You do have the chapter called The Prioritization of Self-Care and the Practice of the Sabbath. You're mm-hmm. over in Old Town, Alexandria, yeah. near your sister church, the Alpha Street Baptist yeah. Church. Yeah. And back in 2019, when Howard John Wesley announced that he was going to take his sabbatical right mm-hmm. before the pandemic, a su- there was a surprising uproar with some faith leaders. Like people, particularly Black church leaders, really right. rejected this idea, which my friends who maneuver in the more white evangelical spaces and well this is something that they do all the time right. talk about you writing this chapter and why this is important for faith leaders like yourself well i mean it's just like it's i, I go to i go to psalm 23 you know the lord is my shepherd i shall not want he leads me beside the still waters leave me the green pastures he restores my soul okay he restores my soul he restores my soul i'm lying down my green pastures i'm by still waters my soul is being restored isn't that a calm place of rest? There's no work going on there. And this is what David is speaking about as his testimony and his life. So we definitely have scripture reference forward. If we look at the gospels of Jesus Christ, we see that he often stole away in times to pray from the ministry and from everyone else. And of course, him being a traditional Jew at that time, they celebrated and practiced the Sabbath. So we don't do it in the same way. We do it as, you know, more sort of um, allegorically, if you will, or um, by saying that there is some time where we take rest. But if we want to be really biblical about it, it's the seventh day that God rested from all of his labors. So, I mean, there's there's biblical support for it. I think that in our tradition, um, namely the African-American tradition, historically, the church has been the bedrock of the community. And because it was the only institution from an American perspective that African-Americans have sort of owned, that kind of was theirs, that they embraced themselves. It was, again, it's the center of the community, so it was always open. And the pastor was not looked at as the person who would just bring the word of God. The pastor was looked at as the shepherd, the counselor, the end all be all, the leader of the community, the civic leader, all these things. So there are a lot of demands that culture um, and society sort of have conditioned us to believe that are not necessarily biblical. So when, when Howard John, my good friend did that, Again, we have other colleagues that have that practices as well that I've known. So it wasn't foreign to me, but I think in the the entire scope of what you're speaking about, yeah, he probably got a lot of of backlash for that. But here's something that I want people to understand, like pastors are people too. Uh Just like church members take their vacations. I have church members come to me during the summer. Well, pastor, you're not going to see me till September. Pastor, I'm going to be out in August. Okay, so they're taking their break away from the church. You know, this is a full-time job. I am a CEO, a manager, and all these things. And I have a wife and I have children. You have to prioritize the things that matter. And what I find so interesting is that before God created the church, God created the family. Mm -hmm. So we have to think about how does family matter? Because here's something else that happened in the pandemic, John. A lot of pastors lost their families either through divorce and other means because people didn't recognize the relationships that they had. And when they came off the road preaching and things of that nature, kind of talk about this too, they had to come to face to face with probably something that they may have neglected. Now that's not to get in everybody's business because you don't know what's happening there. But um, there was a reprioritization of life. Mm -hmm. And for me, the fact that my wife is a PK and I saw what, she reminds me of what she went through as a child. 
she is very adamant about not letting that happen to her children. And of course, she said she would never marry a pastor, but she did. <laughs> you know, so I'm very cognizant of that. And I recognize that in the, when the pandemic happened, I recognized that there were times where I wasn't my best self simply because I didn't rest. But the pandemic gave me a time to rest. We focused. We could not get in the building. People weren't there. And the pool of ministry was different. So in that innovative, creative space, you also had to create time just to be and to be with God and, you know, and exhale. And, and it's, it's healthy. It's healthy to do so. You know, it's interesting. Uh, first, tell your wife she should probably write a book called Never Say Never. Um, <laughs> but um, it's so interesting because growing up in church, uh, being a church boy and having friends that were PKs, uh, and things like that, you know, that people make jokes, you know, PKs are the wildest ones in the church. Yeah. And what I learned as I, I got older and matured is that oftentimes they weren't necessarily uh, the wildest ones in the church, but sometimes PKs felt the neglect that yeah. their parents, whether your mother or your father was the pastor of the church, gave so much to the ministry that they weren't always providing from home. And so one of the things I, I definitely recognize from what you were saying is that I had friends that were pastors who were always on the go. They were, if it was not in the church building, they were on the road evangelizing. Mm -hmm. And so all of a sudden you look up and you're spending more time with your spouse than you ever have. Or one of my friends, she told me, she's like, my husband never really talked when he was at home because he did all the talking at church. Now he's talking to us and we don't, it's like we're getting to know each other again. And so I think that was the challenge for a lot of people. Uh, you know, people religiously uh, were moving as a family unit, but the truth of the matter is they had to actually live it out during the pandemic. And that became tough for a lot of people. You know, it's, it's, it's the true nature of intimacy that probably was neglected because we equated church with God. Yeah. And, that's, and it's not the same, you know, what I've come to recognize through my prayers and just through my mentors and speak with people was this, the church belongs to Jesus Christ. You know, I am replaceable. If something were to happen to me, there would be another call meeting. They would get together, get a search committee and call another pastor. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because that's the very Baptist way of finding right. a pastor. Absolutely. Right, right. Absolutely. So that's what, they, that's what they would do. If, if I was Methodist or somewhere, there would be another appointment. If I was AME, the bishop would appoint somebody else. The church would go on. It belongs to Christ. It's Christ's institution. And we must understand that. But I'm only one me. My wife has one husband and my children have one father, you know, mm -hmm. and that in itself is not really replaceable. You know, um, you can probably do a substitute, but it's not replaceable. You know, if something would happen. So um, my wife really helped me with this. And shout out to Crystal. He did the real Crystal. Y'all look right on, on IG. Um, but because she is a PK and she really had, you know, some trauma from that experience, when we had our second interview at Shiloh, she was in the interview and they asked her a question about, about church. And she gave her sort of somewhat testimony and told them, look, Sundays are for family at the church. So the only thing I ask is after we finish, after he finishes preaching and we go home, that's it. No programs, no meetings, no any of that. So I can create that in our culture. We don't have business meetings. We don't have programs. We don't do all those things on Sundays because people need to be with their families and with themselves. Healthy families and healthy people make healthy churches. And I think that's something that the pandemic helped us to reprioritize and see that family matters. And more importantly, my family matters. My children need to know who I am. They need to know that I'm there with them. And never should it be a case when my children come to me and say, why are you spending more time there than you do with me? Now that can't happen, man. Listen, the real crystal got that Chick-fil-A mentality and I love it. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. We're All closing this shop down on Sunday. Yes, I love it. She, I love she'd, be it. Like, she'd be like, okay, it's time to wrap this up. Okay, you need to stop talking. Come on, babe, let's go. <laughs> I love talking to you because you know, so often you prepare for a conversation like this and you make it easy because you're hitting so many of the points that I wanted to get to you. So I'm shifting like how, what my flow is here. And so I want to go in this area now because you kind of, you touched on it. Um, one, I did a, um, a conference for my bishop, Bishop Neil Ellis down in the Bahamas a couple of years ago. Ooh, okay. And one of the studies, and we were talking about how to do church differently. That was the theme of the, yeah. of the conference that I led. One of the studies that they provided for me uh, had some statistics that said that people's demand and appetite for God was at an all time high, but their desire to attend church was at an all time low. Uh, and you kind of kind of touched on that, like, you know, getting people to come back into churches and stuff like that. How does the black church combat that mindset? How do we get them to appreciate the tradition and the foundation that is the black church and come back into the building? You know, you know, it's that's that's the million dollar question. 
-hmm. You know, um, we actually just went back into the building on Easter. So we had like a two year hiatus. Um, so we did some upgrades and some things from an aesthetic standpoint that we hope will be pleasing to the eye. But I think it all revolves around relationships. When you think about the, I don't want to call them the good old days, but in days where the, the, the higher percentages of communities that gathered together in church, it was because of either two things, the relationships that had been established so families were present, and it was the only place that many of them can go and feel unashamed and accepted. Mm -hmm. I think that sense of shame, um, that sense of not being welcome, um, that judgmental attitude um, that many of our churches exhibit has kept the millennials, like I'm a generation Xer, um, the millennials and the Xers somewhat away. You know, I think I'm probably the last generation of folks that kind of grew up in church and, and still attends because um, of the power of the church and the God of the church. But somewhere in that, you know, life happens. You got extracurricular activities with your children. You got Sunday brunch. <laughs> you got, you know, people, people have people have options. Dr. Know? Healy, can, can we pivot right there? Sure. Because that was one of the stats that they presented me. They uh, uh, There was like one of those Gallup polls or something that said the two biggest threats to modern day church are Sunday brunch and Starbucks, people would get together with groups of their friends on Sunday and just go to have coffee. And the, the study said that the faithful churchgoer now only goes to church once a month. Right. And so when you see all these, just like, you know, a, a lot of folks say, oh, it's traditional television dying because you have all these competing streaming platforms and other ways to entertain yourself. Because of all the competing aspects of folks getting together, gathering, having fellowship outside of the traditions of the church, is there a way to combat all of those competing elements, you know? I think, I, I think the pandemic gave us a paradigm. It surely shifted the paradigm, but I think it gave us a different way to look at community and church. Mm -hmm. So when we could not go in the building, those who had their infrastructures with technology and the ability to stream you know, either being a pre-recorded service or live. We we did our worship was pre-recorded, but I still preach live from the sanctuary. Mm -hmm. We now created an opportunity for people to, to have Christ either enter into their homes or have Christ with them wherever they go. So you take those same individuals now who may meet up for brunch at Starbucks. Well, if they know I have time on Sunday morning, I could be in the building live or I can watch it pre-recorded, but I have access to what I can receive, you know, from the word or from the service. So we had to really flip what we consider the congregation. Congregation is not just the people who are in the building. Congregation are the people that are connected to our ministry. And um, even with our return to worship, we still have more people streaming, you know, at the 10 a.m. hour than we do in the building. And I think we need to be okay with that. Mm -hmm. Because for two years, that's how people have lived their lives. And to expect them, especially if you have competing loyalties. And I'm going to speak about those that have small children. My wife would tell me, I have an eight-year-old and a five-year-old. When I first got to the church, I had a two-year-old and my, my daughter was born while we've been here. She tells me of how just a challenge it was just to get out of the house with children. Mm. You know, you're talking about an hour and a half, two-hour event before you can get to the church because you have toddlers that don't know how they're going to react. You're going to know if you're going to have a bad diaper. You know, if you're going to have a tantrum or fallout, it's just like parenting is just so unpredictable. Well, if they've been in their homes being able to, to watch and not have to deal with that, I'm telling you, man, people are not going to take that fight just to get in the building when they can get the same thing in some aspects at home. So that whole hybrid model of making sure that you have a virtual congregation that's just as part of the people in the building. It matters. And so we had to make some changes to make sure that the people at home are just as important as the people in the building. And so that's a mentality shift. And I think those two can coexist and they have to because people have options and you can't make people come to the building. If it's the generational divide, it is what it is. Let people meet Christ where they are because what they're doing, if they're at brunch or at Starbucks, they may be with their people, but they're still in relationship and in community. So that's a portion of the congregation. That's a whole small group element. Many congregations within the larger, larger congregation, because the larger you grow, everybody simply can't fit in the building. So you have to be innovative in the way you create spaces for folks to gather. 
So I think the pandemic has forced it upon us and, and it's here to stay. It's not going away. And you, and you have a chapter in your book, The Pandemic Pastor, just about the virtual model and, yeah. and how you, what you're offering uh, for your people. Yeah. What inspired you to write this book? Like what made you say, you know what, I need to pull together this blueprint for uh, my comrades in the ministry? A couple of things. Well, when the pandemic hit, I was in my final semester of my doctoral program. And so when I finished that, I did that on um, pastoral prophetic preaching. And the approach that I would look to be pastoral meant that I had to think about ways to create environments for people to hear. Okay, so I did that from a preaching standpoint. Then the pandemic hit. So I'm glad that when I got to Shiloh, we made some technology infrastructure upgrades that gave us the ability to, of course, give and worship and stream. So all of those things were in place. So really, the ministry didn't take a hit. We actually flourished during that time period because the people who were at the church saw what was available to them. And then people who could not come to the building now saw what Shiloh was doing, just as other churches were doing, because you had an even playing field. You know, I, I have people that would watch five or six services. So, um, you know, from different churches all on Sunday, they, they church surf, you know, on Sundays. And people still do that. So as I thought about this, you know, my prayer time was revealed to me that I needed to, to put pen to paper. And part of my approach to ministry that was from my doctoral dissertation, part of that naturally flowed into how I chose to lead the ministry. And so the philosophies were in alignment. And I said, I need to reflect upon this. And of course, God pressed it upon me to write it during the Lenten season in 2021. So I was waking up at two, three in the morning, you know, every day during that 40, 40 um, day period. And just were right for two or three hours before the day began. Because remember, it's the prioritization of family. So that means I got to work at hours that I may not be used to working, but my, I had to be present for my family um, and not let that time impede with them. And it just began to flow. I thought about those churches who closed. I thought about those churches that would not be returning to ministries. I thought about the people that really needed to, to the ministry to meet them where they were. So I said, okay, well, how do I do that? Well, we were already doing it. So we had, you know, virtual Bible study. And we, to this day, we still do Bible study virtually because you know how traffic is in the DMV. <laughs> it's too much for people to get to church. So if we can find a way to get people connected, let's do that as well. We moved our children's church from Sundays to Saturdays because of those competing loyalties with recreation or extracurricular activities. And we wanted the family to worship together at one time on Sundays. We said, okay, well, let's let the children worship or at 10 a.m. on a Saturday, because normally that's time before they have gymnastics or swimming, you know, or anything else that they're doing there, they still can get church. When our women and our men meet, when our married couples meet, whatever we're doing, it has to have a virtual component. One of my mentors, and of course, John, J John K. Jenkins, pastor, you know, First Baptist Glen Arden, we had lunch um, probably about um, sometime last year, and we were talking about this. And he said, man, you know what, you have to make sure that everything you do is virtual, even if you're meeting in person has to be a virtual component because here's what that says that tells that person that can't be there physically that i matter mm -hmm. and i think that people really just want to be included they just want to know that they matter so how can you create environments and spaces for them to do so and that's kind of what shifted and guided you know how we did ministry and i feel that we as a people speaking myself to help those other ministries um you know who may even think uh, what i'm presenting who may would agree with may have there enough another angle that's fine too but I had to put it down. And again, for me walking in my why, the Lord said, get my message to the masses. And I know that print and media can travel further than a sermon on Sunday morning. So you had to put it down. And um, you know, I'm, I'm glad to do that and, and thank God for the opportunity. One of the other chapters you have in your book is The Church Belongs to Christ, uh, The Danger of Pride and Religious Symbolism. Unpack that chapter, which is chapter two in the book for me. Tell me a little bit more about that chapter. Man, that, that, that was one I was kind of, I was kind of treading a little lightly because I didn't want to touch all people's, you know, toes. But think about this, man, to your point, when you had a lot of friends who were, you know, pastors that were always evangelizing on the road, well, when the pandemic hit, the road stopped, <laughs> you know, that was one thing. And from a preaching perspective, you did not have a congregation with you in person because, mm. you know, we have that we thou experience as um, James Harris calls it at part of the school of divinity, you know, the, the, the worship moment is, is interactive with us in our tradition. So what do you do when you stand and there's nobody there to say amen? When you ask for a witness and you can't hear the witness. So now you have to be ready to preach and you are your own choir witness 
everything. I'm, I'm laughing, uh, Dr. Heatley, because I, I, I hear a preacher say, turn to your neighbor. Ain't no neighbors in the church. Ain't no neighbor turn to. Hey, yeah. look, what you going to do? So think about all the, all, the, all the lingo, all the vernacular, all these you know customs and traditions that we've had. Well, guess what? They're no longer relevant because it doesn't work. So now it forces the pastor to let the ego go because you can't feed off the congregation helping you. The only help that you have is you and God. And you should be preaching to an audience in one anyway. And so it calls into question, what is my preparation? What am I really saying? Because now you really have to have something to say because now people on the devices, they don't have to stay glued to the devices. They can get up, get coffee. Some people be cooking. They may be laying in the bed. They got all these competing things with their message. What are you going to do to get them there? You know, so that's, an, that's one thing. The other thing is we have these sacred cows and things as traditions and customs that we've given divinity to that no longer matter. Ushers came march. <laughs> Deacons came meet. You know, you know what I'm saying? All this stuff, you know, turn to your, turn to your neighbor. It's non-existent now. So what are you going to do? Like, what can you do? So, so how, how now do you, again, present Christ in a way that matters and is relevant and effective? And one of the ways that we did that is, was we looked at our symbolism. We actually changed our logo because our logo had our historic sanctuary in it. Mm -hmm. But remember, we're not worshiping in person and we haven't worshiped in that building in 15 years. Wow. So if the logo we're presenting is a building that we're not worshiping, we're giving, we're giving confusing messages. So let's put the logo back on Christ. And so I go through that and see how to change the logo and how we just lift up the cross. Because I think that there's any symbolism that's kind of got lost, you know, in this new age church is the cross of Calvary. So we want to make sure we put that there because that's how we all came together. But it really just calls us to ask the question why. And I think if we do that as a normal approach to life about asking why we do what we do, we'll be more effective. We have more focus and we'll live in purpose. So that's kind of how that chapter came together. I love hearing you talk about church branding. One of my friends, uh, uh, Pastor Courtney Beard, literally, uh, when he's not out ministering to people or being the chaplain for Israel and Newbury, he is on the road helping churches with their branding and overhauling their image in the digital thumbprint. Because, mm -hmm. you know, yes, your foundation is in faith, but in order to reach the people, you have to use the contemporary means of engaging them. People want to come to something that's attractive, that's enticing. And if we can't make God that way, then why are they going to come, you know? You know, I mean, that's that's the, the the scripture that I used in First Corinthians nine when Paul says, "Did you ever become like a Jew?" To the Greek, I became Greek. I become like all things to men and women to win them for the sake of Christ. That's meeting people where they are. You know, because again, that branding matters. Because remember, your front door was no longer the front door of the building. Your front door was either your social media or your website. So we had to do. We had to like we we redid our website. You know, still in the process of always you know, updating our social media. That changes so much, man. It's just crazy how fast that stuff moves. But you have to have dedicated people towards that. And I, and I pastor a historically traditional Black Baptist church. So a lot of the things that I'm presenting to them are totally new. And we're in the transition of doing so. But the pandemic offered me an opportunity to push some things very, very forward. So I was, I was very, very happy about that. And it's still a work in progress, as you know, just with anything you do. You're always reinventing. You're always imagining. You're always updating. We're not. I don't feel we're there. We're supposed to be, but I think we're on the right track. Finish this sentence for me, Doctor Heatley. Uh, the black church will survive if the black church will survive if it remains committed to the cause of Christ. And what I mean by that is presentation of love, recognizing that people are people. We all have differences, but if we meet them where they are we will always be relevant and be able to show them the love of Christ. Now that can take a lot of different meanings. And I think every church has its DNA and that's a different way of doing that. I think that's the beauty of the kingdom because we really do have multiple arms by which we do things and that people have options. But I think that the black church itself must know its history, know the mission, but be unafraid to switch the method. Because I think you can be faithful to the mission but you can't be faithful to the methods because the methods cause you to get stuck and become museums where pastors now become curators as opposed to innovators. I love that. I love that. Uh, one last thing before I let you go, you know, there, because of the pandemic and just some of the life uh, challenges in general, we've noticed that there's been an influx of people dying by suicide. If there's anybody watching out here, uh, 
you know, that are just going through the trials of life and they figure life should be over for them. Offer some words of encouragement to somebody that just may have happened to cross this broadcast, this conversation, and they just need a little something to make them think that they can stay in the game. Listen, God loves you. Your life matters. You matter. You are somebody. You are not a mistake. There is so much more to life in you. You are loved by God. You are screaming out. Just, just call out the name of Jesus and watch the miraculous powers of God at work. It is not over. Don't you give up on yourself. Don't you give up on God. There is too much power, too much destiny, too much for you to live. Please do not give up. Love is there and it's with you. Please do not give up. God loves you. God gave his life for you. Call someone for help, but please know you are not alone because God has his angels who will come to see about you and you will make it. Just win the day. Win the second, win the minute, win the hour, win the day. Then you can work on winning the week, winning the month, and win the year. But as long as you make it to another second, that tells you that God has not given up on you. Come on, keep fighting. Keep fighting for I your life. I love that. The Pandemic Pastor is available anywhere you get books. And Pastor Heatley, tell them where they can find you on social media. Look, y'all can catch me on social media, tab Quincy Heatley on IG, tab Quincy Heatley on Facebook. Uh, Tab Quincy Heatley YouTube, all of those things that are there. You can get the book on my website too, tabquincyheatley.com. Um, the main thing is, you know, just, just, just look for it, search for it. Amazon is probably the best way to get it. I also want to encourage those who may not be pastors, but you lead an organization or you have a management position. I know it's called the Pandemic Pastor, but it really is a book about leading in crisis. And I've had a lot of people who are not necessarily pastors per se in the conventional sense come to me and say that the book has blessed them because it caused them to do some realignment with their families. It caused them to rethink their approaches to their organizations. It impressed upon them to learn about the culture, the places that they serve. And so there's a lot of philosophical things in there that I believe that can help anyone. Actually, I just did a talk uh, last week where the and moderator told me, like, you know, you, you have me and my parent. <laughs> and I was just like, wow, you know, never intended to do that. But it comes from a place of love. You know, I'm, I'm just a, a husband and a father who loves God and then trying my best to serve humanity. And, and Jean, thank you so much. Again, much success to you. And thank you so much for the opportunity, brother. I really do appreciate it. Listen, I appreciate you joining me today. And I appreciate you giving this impartation to help the people. It's necessary. Definitely necessary. Amen. Surely is. Surely is. Surely is. Thank you.